When scribes penned the book of Leviticus, it wasn't to bring law and a code of conduct to mankind. A full 1,100 years earlier, King Hammurabi had already done that, carving his laws into a black stone obelisk. Copies of this code were pressed into clay tablets and distributed across Mesopotamia. This would become the basis for Babylonian law for centuries. A code that would be posted on clay tablets in the Jewish quarter in Babylon during their exile in that city. Around the same time that the Jews wrote their law code that we find in Leviticus. Now before we get started, I want to apologize in advance for the audio quality. You may hear some background music, and that's because I wasn't able to record this episode in my usual comfy chair at home. I had to take my microphone out on the road with me when I went out of town, and today I just found a nice, comfy, and mostly quiet place to record inside the chapel beneath a truck stop in Portage, Wisconsin. So I'm about a thousand miles from home in a church. So, coming to you pre-recorded from a Christian underground lair, I'm your host Jason, and you're listening to Dragons in Genesis. The entire book of Leviticus takes place immediately after the final scene in Exodus. Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the law code he received from Yahweh, the second law code, and proceeds to go over the entire set of rules with the Israelites. While the story of Moses gives no details that would allow us to set this story in history, no pharaoh names, no famous battles, etc., and the best scholars can determine is that he supposedly lived somewhere between 1575 BCE and 1275 BCE, the story of Leviticus itself and much of the Moses story as a whole, it seems to be the product of a much later time, closer to 600 BCE or even later, with parts of the story not reaching their final form until well after the Babylonian exile. Now, the early chapters of Leviticus are, to put it gently, mind-numbingly tedious. Moses outlines just how a person is to bring an offering to Yahweh. Of course, since this has been edited and filled with additions by the priestly writer, we get the proclamation that all sacrifices must be brought to Yahweh through the priests. The individual Israelite is not allowed to make sacrifice or offerings themselves, but instead must bring their cows, goats, grain, etc. to the priest who will do it on their behalf and take a sizable portion of the offering for themselves. This seems like a pretty good gig, very little work and plenty of reward. But it's not all peachy. When they go for the trial run on their very first sacrifice, things don't quite go as planned. Now, each type of offering listed comes with a set of instructions that's pretty much repeated word for word for the next type of offering, with only minor variations. If you want to make a burnt offering, it must be this type of animal without blemish brought to the priest who will then do this to kill it and splash much blood over the altar and then cut it into pieces and burn it and so on. If it's a cow, you do this. If it's a goat, do that. If it's a bird, do this. Then it moves on to the offering of produce and grain and all the rest. And for each, the priests are going to take their share. The lion's share, actually. Yahweh gets very little of each offering, so it sounds like this is a method for the priest to get rich and well taken care of without having to maintain flocks and herds and engage in any type of meaningful work. And this is important. Not the priest skimming from the temple, but the farming. Supposedly, this is a set of laws and a code of conduct for a nomadic people who camp in a different location every few days and are always on the move, but they have countless laws concerning the handling of produce sacrifices and for farming, as well as dealing with permanent structures such as brick houses. Now, I'm no expert on the Bedouins, but I've done more than my fair share of hiking and backpacking, and I dare say that no one carries around a brick house on a camping trip. 
it's obvious just from these instances in this one book that these laws were from a time when the people lived in permanent settlements with active farms and solid homes. In fact, there's very little dealing with the arrangement of tents or maintenance of a temporary camp. In fact, the only mention we have of temporary structures comes when outlining how to deal with the harvest festivals when workers would set up temporary houses closer to the farmland so they wouldn't have to travel all the way back to the city after a long day of work. But even that implies city life, so we aren't dealing with a nomadic people here, as the story would have us believe. After detailing how to perform a sacrifice, we see the ordination of Aaron and his two sons, Nadab and Abihu, into the priesthood of Yahweh. This is an attempt for the modern priest, and by modern I mean from the 6th century BC when this was being scribbled on parchment, to claim ancient authority for their order. Prior to this, we have dozens of gods being worshipped in the temple, including El's wife, Asherah, and even Neheshton, which we first saw reference to in the Eden story as the serpent in the garden, and we'll see again as a bronze serpent in the book of Numbers. But by the time Leviticus was written, these other gods had fallen out of favor and were no longer worshipped in open, so we only get vague references to them or their icons. So in Leviticus 8, the modern priests are essentially making the claim that their lineage dates all the way back to the time of Moses a thousand years prior, and only they were ordained. No other priests for any other gods received this honor. This is sort of like the Catholic Church inventing a succession of popes going all the way back to Peter to claim an unbroken linear connection to Jesus. As part of the ordination process, Aaron and his sons must remain in the tent of meeting for seven days. If they leave, Yahweh will strike them dead immediately. Once the hostage situation is over, Aaron is instructed by Moses to leave the tent and make a sin offering and a burnt offering. This will then summon Yahweh. So there's more blood and slaughtered animals, and suddenly in Leviticus 9, Yahweh appears in person before all of the Israelites, like every single one. And it says that everyone saw Yahweh, then they shouted and fell prostrate on the ground. Wait, didn't we read in Exodus 32.20 that no one could see Yahweh without dying? Someone needs to get their story straight, because we keep getting examples of people seeing Yahweh and surviving. But not all will survive. Part of Yahweh's instructions are for the priest to bring him fire pans for incense. And in Leviticus 10, the priest Nadab and Abihu, the two sons of Aaron, do just that. They each take a fire pan, put fire in them, and then lay incense on top and present the pans to Yahweh, who instantly murders them both for their transgression. Wait. What did they do wrong? Okay, let's go over that again. Yahweh's instructions are for the priest to bring him fire pans and incense. Nadab and Abihu each take a fire pan, put fire in them, and lay incense on top. Oh, there we are. Yahweh never told them to put fire in the pans. He wanted to light the fire himself. Shame on those two priests for being helpful and taking the initiative by lighting the fire in the pans intended for holding fire. So Yahweh strikes two of his first three priests dead for failing at the most rigged game of Simon Says in the history of Israel, and then goes on a rant about alien fire. He'll accept outside flames for every other type of offering, but in this one instance, when it comes to incense... He, and only he, is allowed to provide fire. And if you provide the fire, as you do for every other type of sacrifice, you will be punished. And it's not just like a quick death, no. The first two priests of Yahweh's order burst into flames before their father and die screaming. Yahweh then says, Through those near to me, I show myself to be holy and gain glory before all the people. After this, Moses tells Aaron 
that he's not allowed to weep for his burning children, or Yahweh will do the same to him. Moses then ropes Aaron's next two sons into the priesthood and informs them that if they mourn the loss of their brothers, Yahweh will murder them and then lash out at the entire community of Israel. He also forbids them from leaving the tent or drinking wine before entering, and of course the punishments for these offenses is death. There's also some confusion about whether or not the sin offering of a goat should be eaten. Aaron burns it, and then Moses asks him why he didn't eat it. Unsure, Aaron explains that he thought he was supposed to burn the goat, not eat it. Uh, he says that he then fears being killed by Yahweh. Moses then admits that he was right and the goat was supposed to be burned and realizes that if Aaron had misunderstood that part of the process, he too would have been murdered. So Yahweh would have lost all three of his priests on the very first day. But only two out of the three were burned alive, so I suppose it's a pretty good start. By this point... We're only a third of the way through Leviticus, yet everything that is going to happen in this book has already happened. Actually, that one scene in which the priests are burned alive and then replaced represents the entirety of action in the book. Everything before and after is recitation of law code. But that doesn't mean we can't get some excitement. Leviticus still has leprosy and crazy taxonomy to offer, as well as moldy houses, handling of corpses, and sexual impurity. What comes next in Leviticus 11 is our first real glimpse into the minds of the ancient Israelites with regards to how they organized the natural world. This is a chapter about clean and unclean animals, but it's deeper than that. This is early science, an attempt to understand nature. They divide the animals into groups and try to find common traits among those animals in each group. For instance, we have herbivorous animals like cows, goats, deer, pigs, camels, and rabbits. Some of them, like cows, goats, deer, and pigs, have split hooves, while rabbits and camels have paws. They see cows, deer, goats, camels, and rabbits making a chewing motion even when they haven't just taken a bite, so they assume they're all chewing cud. Here's some overlap. Some of these animals, the cows, deer, and goats, have split hooves and chew cud. So they deem them to be proper herbivores, suitable for eating. But those camels and rabbits chew cud but don't have split hooves, and the pigs have split hooves but don't chew cud, so there's something wrong with them. They don't fit the category, so they're not allowed as food. Now, it should be noted that rabbits don't actually chew cud. They aren't ruminants. They just make a chewing motion all the time to confuse Bronze Age people. However, the Bible does state that they chew cud, giving us another example of how the limited knowledge of the biblical writers is expressed. This wasn't information passed down from some all-knowing source, but from primitive people struggling to make sense of a complex world. It should also be noted that nowhere in the text does it say anything about illness from eating these forbidden animals, which is an argument often offered as an explanation. Other cultures knew how to cook pork without exposing themselves to trichinosis, including other Semitic groups, as well as the Egyptians. This wasn't hidden knowledge. Eating meat that wasn't fully cooked would have actually been forbidden as they had a blood taboo. We actually see that later in the chapter where they forbid eating anything that has blood in it. Uh, if it looked red on the inside, that was just wrong. So rare steak was sinful. They would have cooked their pork all the way and foodborne pathogens just wouldn't have been a problem. So this wasn't about food poisoning. So the idea that the prohibition on pork was to save them from disease just doesn't hold water. Besides, the text already gives us a reason. They had a clear definition for proper grazing animals, and pigs, and camels, and rabbits just didn't fit that definition. This idea of categories and category confusion 
pops up again and again in Leviticus. We see it again a few lines later when dealing with fish. Yahweh outlines what makes a proper fish. A proper fish, as described in Leviticus 11.9, lives in water, has scales and fins. Seems like a good enough definition of a fish to me. But when they saw things like lobsters that had shells instead of scales, or sharks that had skin, or squid that had neither scales nor fins, those are labeled as abominations because they didn't fit the description. They aren't proper fish. In the next few verses, Yahweh also outlines what makes a proper bird. And of course, those that fail to fit the category are considered abominations. There's a stern prohibition on association with anything that confuses these categories. So flightless birds like emus and roadrunners are abominable. Yahweh also lists bats as abominations. Yeah, Yahweh clearly states in Leviticus 11 that bats are a type of bird. It's another example that the Bible is working with the same limitations of knowledge that its audience possessed. There's no revelation in the Bible, no point at which the text bestows knowledge on the Israelites that wasn't already widely known. In fact, there's some knowledge that the Greeks and Egyptians were already aware of that the Israelites get wrong. For instance, Yahweh believes that the earth is a flat disk supported by stone pillars, but centuries earlier, the Greeks had already proved the earth to be spherical. And both Egyptians and Greeks were coming to the understanding that microscopic life forms were responsible for some illnesses. Egyptians actually called them tiny animals and successfully practiced sterilization before surgical procedures and painted their eyes with black liner that was filled with lead to prevent conjunctivitis. They flushed their wounds with honey to stave off infection, something that is still practiced today in American hospitals. Yet we will see later in this book that their understanding of illness is not only regressive for its time, but dangerously ignorant. At the end of chapter 11, Yahweh talks about insects. Leviticus 11.20-23 starts with Yahweh telling the people that all winged swarming things that go on all fours are abominations. But then he goes on to make exceptions, stating that those with jointed legs above their feet may be eaten. He then lists locusts, grasshoppers, and crickets as safe animals to eat. He then repeats that all winged swarming things are abominations. Now there are a few things here that confuse me, like all of it. He says they're all abominations, then says that those with jointed legs are all right, but every insect has jointed legs. He says that if they swarm and crawl around and have wings, they're abomination, but then goes on to list grasshoppers, locusts, and crickets, which are all swarmed, winged bugs. Lastly, Yahweh keeps saying that these animals walk on all fours. Apparently, the all-powerful creator of the universe can't count to six. Either that, or it's one of those entrapment deals where he wants you to eat one just so he can set you on fire. I'm not sure because I don't see an instance in here where anyone tests him on that. Just as an aside, I've eaten assorted bugs, including crickets, grasshoppers, locusts, various beetles, along with shellfish like crawfish, and have never burst into flames, so these laws might not still be in effect. Now, we get to another good part in chapter 13, where Yahweh tells the people how to deal with infections. At first, it all sounds like pretty good advice. If a person has some sort of infection, they are separated from the rest of the tribe and kept apart until the infection clears up. It goes into some detail about identifying leprosy. Also good advice. If the infection spreads, they're to be removed entirely. If they get better, they can eventually rejoin the tribe after a purification ritual. It's not simple enough. 
Then we have a couple of odd points that creep into the chapter. One states that if a person is burned and the hair near the burn turns white, they are to be pronounced leprous and cast out. This is in Leviticus 13.24. Apparently, Yahweh doesn't know that leprosy is caused by a bacteria, not by heat, and exposure to heat often causes hairs and skin to turn white. The second curious thing in this section, which actually comes first, but I saved it for last, is just before that, when it states that if the leprous infection spreads to cover the entire person, so he or she is 100% leper from head to toe, then, wait, no, I'm not going to paraphrase this because you'll think I'm just making it up. I'm going to read straight from Leviticus 13.13. 13. These are the words that Yahweh spoke to Moses and Aaron on the topic of leprosy. Then the priest shall look, and behold, if the leprosy has covered all his flesh, he shall pronounce him clean that hath the plague, for it all turned white. He is clean. No, no, no. I'm sorry, but if a leper is 100% covered with leprosy, he's the exact polar extreme full-on opposite of clean. He's very much leprous. In fact, he's fully leprous. Like, how did the entire Jewish population not get wiped out the first time they encountered a severe case of leprosy? This is what happens when you get your wisdom from a Bronze Age manuscript. It's very much bad information. Let's shun the guy who singed his eyebrows but drop quarantine on the leper because he's now more bacteria than man. That makes sense. Now, I'm not entirely sure how contagious leprosy is or how easily it spreads, but this just seems like a really bad idea. Okay, sorry, I just had to get that out. Moving on. In chapter 14, Yahweh tells them that when they enter the land of Canaan, that he will give them as a possession... Yahweh will inflict an eruptive plague of mold on some of the houses they decide to inhabit, and then gives them instructions on how to clean the homes of mold, and instructions to destroy the houses if the cleansing process doesn't work. Like, really? Why not just not curse their homes with mold? Wouldn't that be simpler? After this, we get an overview of their laws. Now, I'm not going to go into each law because they're just not that interesting and most of them are covered in the Hammurabi Code, but I will touch on a few that leap out of the text and beg to be commented upon. In Leviticus 17, we get a prohibition on personal sacrifice. Anyone who sacrifices an animal on their own is to be cut off from the people of Israel. All sacrifices must be brought through the priests. This is, of course, to centralize worship and empower the priestly class. Prior to this, people sacrificed whenever and wherever they wanted, including all of those special altars that were set up in the Genesis story. It should be noted that all of those altars will later be closed, and we'll visit that topic later. In Leviticus 18, Yahweh tells them not to copy the practices of Egypt and Canaan, completely ignoring the fact that most of their laws and practices, including those he is currently commanding, come from either Egypt or Canaan, such as the circumcision from Egypt and the Passover festival from Canaan. Near the end of chapter 18, we get the prohibition on homosexual intercourse, and curiously, it's phrased the same as the category confusion prohibitions we saw earlier concerning animals. It states that a man mustn't lay with a man the way he lays with a woman. You have this clear category. You know, this is how you should, a man must lay with a woman. That is a proper act of intercourse. If a man lays with a man, that is category confusion. It's an abomination. Again, as in every other instance of category confusion from earlier, it calls the act an abomination. It says the same about women lying with animals. 
it follows this up with the claim that this is the reason the Canaanites are being rejected, because they all defile themselves in this manner. I suppose all the women are sleeping with animals and all the men are sleeping with other dudes. Um, kind of makes you wonder how the Canaanites can successfully reproduce. Or maybe the writers of Leviticus are just throwing shade on their enemies. Do not rape a female slave who is promised to another man. It's okay if she's not promised to anyone. There's a prohibition on making scars in your flesh to count the dead, but it says nothing about tattoos. Leviticus 19.32 says that you must fear Yahweh. But by this point, I don't think you would really need a reminder of that. You're not supposed to sacrifice a child to Molech. Notice it doesn't state that you can't sacrifice a child to Yahweh. That, presumably, is still allowed. Anyone who insults his parents shall be put to death. It also outlines what constitutes adultery for a man. If a man sleeps with the wife of another man, he has committed adultery. It says nothing about premarital sex, nothing about multiple wives, nothing about sleeping with harlots, etc. It's just a prohibition on sleeping with the wife of another man. Now here's a good one. If a brother and sister sleep together, they must be sent away. But if you sleep with your daughter-in-law or your cousin, it is improper and you must be put to death. Now how the hell does that work? If a man marries the wife of his deceased brother, it is indecent and they shall not be able to bear children. Wait, Yahweh once killed men if they refused to father children with the wife of their deceased brother. Now he punishes them for doing the exact thing he once commanded? We're getting some mixed signals here, Yahweh. The Jews are holy before Yahweh. Everyone else is abhorrent. Oh, here's one. No one with a blemish, birth defect, is blind, is lame, has a limb too short or too long, has a broken limb, a hunchback, is a dwarf, has a boil scar, scurvy, a growth on his eye, or crushed testicles, can make offerings to Yahweh. Just remember, he loves everyone equally. No, not really. That's nowhere in there. In Leviticus 23, Yahweh commands the Israelites to celebrate the Feast of Booths during a specific time of year in which they must leave their permanent homes and live in little square shacks for seven days. It says that this is to remind them how they didn't always live in permanent houses, but once had to live in tents when they were in the desert. Wait, what? At, yeah, at this point in the story, they're still 40 years away from living in permanent homes. They currently live in tents and haven't yet entered the desert. So the timing of this statement makes no sense within the context of the story. Oh wait, I'm supposed to pretend this is actually written while they're hanging out beside a volcano, not when they're living in permanent homes in Jerusalem. Okay, got it. Also, this living in little square huts aligned in rows beside the road during a harvest period outside a city bears a striking resemblance to something that occurred every year in Canaan outside the city of Ugarit during the harvest when workers would leave the city, journey out into the outlying farmlands, erect temporary rectangular huts, and live in them until the work was done, and then hold a big harvest celebration afterward. What was that from earlier about not adopting the practices of the people of Canaan? Now it should be noted that this was likely the origin of the modern Thanksgiving festival, or something like it. We have the story about the pilgrims and natives and kids drawing hand turkeys, but people were celebrating these kinds of festivals all across Europe long before anyone sailed across the Atlantic. And they were celebrating them in the Middle East long before that. The pilgrim story 
was just a new tale to reboot an old festival, just as the command by Yahweh to do this for no good reason at all was a way to turn a Canaanite pagan practice into a Jewish practice. In chapter 24, a man speaks the name of Yahweh in blasphemy. So Yahweh commands Moses to stone that man to death. Yahweh then, in the very next sentence, tells them that anyone who kills another human being must be put to death. He apparently didn't see the irony here. At the end of chapter 25, Yahweh states that the Israelites are his children, and people from all other lands can be captured and taken as slaves. So, that's pleasant. We get one final reference to a transition from a personal worship to the priestly authority in Leviticus 26.1, when Yahweh tells the people they're not allowed to worship on their own, but must worship at the sanctuary. They must bring all sacrifices to the priests. Anyone who disobeys this and tries to worship on their own is to be cast out. Finally, Yahweh will give the land of Canaan to the Israelites where they can live forever in peace, and he will live among them and not spurn them. Yahweh then tells the Israelites that if they fail him in any way, he will visit misery upon them. Consumption and fever, enemies will steal from them and enslave them, and Yahweh himself will destroy their places of worship and bury those temples beneath piles of Hebrew bodies, and he will force them to eat the flesh of their own children. Remember to like us on Facebook. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to send me a message on there. I want to give a shout out to all the new listeners who have been popping up and sending messages. I do appreciate the feedback. If you want to help out, go drop a positive review on iTunes. And as always, thank you for listening.